Hello and welcome to Changemakers, a student-run show focusing on Gen Z activism both in the Harrisonburg community and on a national and international level. I'm Madison Heritzik. And I'm Olivia Roth. In order to understand Gen Z's advocacy against gun violence, you first need to understand the world they grew up in. According to the Pew Research Center, Generation Z started in 1997. From January of 1997 until the turn of the new millennium, there were 19 school shootings in the United States. The Columbine shooting is the most well-known from this era. The 1999 shooting shook the United States from 2000 to 2010. There were 80 school shootings. Surprisingly, that's actually 19 fewer than the previous decade. But, and here's the context you need, from the time Gen Zers started school in around 2003 until 2016, when those first Gen Zers started graduating, there were 183 school shootings. That's an average of around 14 school shootings per year. Breaking it down even more, in a 180-day school year, there's roughly one shooting in the U.S. per 13 school days. You know the names. Sandy Hook, Parkland, Uvalde. But for all the ones that made national and international headlines, there are hundreds of less publicized shootings that haunt and stay with students in districts large and small across the country. The ever-present threat of gun violence in a place that's supposed to be safe has affected so many more Gen Zers than just those who died. Any efforts to curb the violence, from school resource officers, to lockdown drills, to even teaching elementary age students how to staunch bleeding from gun wounds, have been met with failure. In response to this, Gen Z has spearheaded the movement to advocate for gun reform, as high schoolers have walked out of class to have their voices heard, including here in the friendly city. In the past eight months, two shootings in Harrisonburg off-campus parties have had many high schoolers and college students on edge. As recently as Saturday, a police-involved shooting happened on Liberty Street in downtown. As Changemakers reporters Emily Host shows us, students are ready for a change and standing up to gun violence. It takes one selfish person with a gun to take the life of our children. Put the guns down. Clara Fields, a 17-year-old high schooler in Harrisonburg, died in an overnight shooting. Days later, hundreds of high schoolers and community members showed up to Court Square to protest gun violence wearing Field's favorite color, red. Just put guns down and, and just find ways of, of solving other problems other than killing each other. It's taking a toll on the community. We can come together and be a strong community. A gun, isn't, a gun doesn't do nothing but cause grief and, and just taking a risk of taking somebody else's life. The guns are not the, the way to solve problems. And maybe one day people would just if they have them, just keep them away from teenagers and children. I'm not going to stop until we get everybody on the same page and everybody can just not have these petty beefs, which causes that. It's supposed to be every day that we know that guns are not, gun violence isn't a good thing. My baby's not happy. I'll let y'all know that he's not happy. He told me he loved me and that he was so happy. Thanks, Mom. I love you. That's the last words I heard out of my son's mouth. But that's what keeps pushing me today, because I know he was so good, and y'all making me more proud of him. I was already proud, but this right here, it makes me even more proud. Months after a shooting at UVA, students are still mourning the loss of three UVA football players and share the same sentiments as the protesters in Harrisonburg. So I've walked on this bridge every day since the start of the school year, and before the shooting, it felt like every week there was a new design. But since then, nobody's touched it, and... I don't think anybody's ever going to paint over it. You kind of see a new shooting in the news like three times a week. And then when it happens two blocks away from your house, it kind of really does have a different impact. I think it's absolutely mortifying that that's where we are in society, that that's just a normal thing. People a lot more qualified than me are going to have to seriously make some decisions. The fact that people's lives have turned into this political issue is a lot of where the problem lies. As a result, more people are dying. I feel like it can't just keep going on. We gotta hold each other accountable. I want you to look at your neighbor, and I want you to tell your neighbor, I want to see you tomorrow. And we need to get out of the passive. We need to be aggressive, because the world is being aggressive against us. All it takes is one voice. And your voice, everybody here has made a, a vow today that we want to be part of the difference. We want to be the difference. Reporting for Changemakers, I'm Emily Host.
Well, we are now joined by Emily here at the desk. Emily, thank you so much for reporting on this story. And tell us, what were some of the most powerful parts during this reporting journey of yours? Well, thanks for having me. And I mean, as you can see in these stories, there's just so much emotion. And it was just really interesting and just really impactful to be talking to these people and hear their point of view from these traumatic events that they endured. And it really just puts it into perspective, you know, like something needs to change. And I think touching on that is, is like how often these tragedies happen after each other. It's almost like they can't breathe until the next, before the next one even happens. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big part of it too. Well, when you look at the Harrisonburg community and what this community itself has endured, you had the Bridgewater College shooting that happened about a year and a half ago that took the lives of two police officers. And then during the protest that you were a part of, they were honoring the life of a Harrisonburg High School student that was mm -hmm. killed as well. And so you're seeing this community come together and try and find a way to make change, mm -hmm. despite the fact that, as you've mentioned, and things just seem to happen so quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this generation is just so desensitized to this now, this problem. And But at the same time, you know, you see all this emotion that everybody has and how much they want to change this. So I really am interested to see how they continue to combat this issue. Well, thank you for joining us at the table and thank you for reporting this for us. What else do you have? Well, thank you. So each year, thousands of refugees come to the United States in search for a better quality of life. JMU is working with ECAR, an initiative to help these families in their resettlement. Today, I am joined by Steve Grandy, Director of Community Service and Learning at JMU. Thanks for being here, Steve. Thanks, Emily. Thanks for having me. Well, first of all, can you tell me exactly what ECAR does? Sure. So ECAR was started by a Guilford College faculty member in North Carolina. She's an English professor, but someone who came from a refugee family and she discovered that there's so much more colleges can be doing to support refugee families. So at first, Guilford College uh, began this process of saying, can we just house one refugee family in the Guilford community? But that spread to a national movement. And so now um, there are chapters across the country that have taken on this idea that universities have a responsibility to use our resources to support the entire community while also providing educational opportunities for students. And so that's where ECAR, Every Campus a Refuge, was born. And so JMU now is the 14th chapter of ECAR. So can you tell me a little bit about um, JMU's involvement with ECAR and the transition to becoming an ECAR campus? Sure. So um, for many years, there have been faculty and students who have joined uh, with the community to support refugee families, all kinds of efforts and across uh, a variety of disciplines. And those have been happening kind of as one-off efforts, really well-intentioned, but they haven't been coordinated. Uh, but um, last year, um, we proposed that um, with just the continuing influx uh, of refugees that um, JMU attempt to actually use some of our housing to support families. That's one of the biggest challenges that refugees face is finding even just temporary housing until they can find a permanent uh, place to reside. So um, we had available housing over the summer that was not being used. And so we proposed, could that housing be used over the summer and be available as tempor a temporary um, place for refugee families. And, um, and it worked out. We got um, great support from the senior administration to do that. But that also meant not just a roof over their head, but also other kinds of support. So English conversation hours and welcome meals and learning about public transportation. The goal is to make refugee families sustainable. So they're going to um, live on their own two feet and um, be big contributors to the community. We already have a history in Harrisonburg of that. This is a community that's um, full of refugees that have become uh, important leaders in this community. So that's what JMU is contributing to. And so that got us started on this ECAR path by doing that last summer. We had a group of faculty who were with us and, um, and ECAR said there are resources out there that you can take advantage of and part of that helps if you become a chapter. So that, uh, we went back to the administration and they supported that. So touching on community, can you tell me a little bit about, or I guess like a better way to phrase this was, like what do you hope that this project will do for the surrounding community? Sure, so um, everything we do ought to be mutually beneficial. And what I mean by that is it ought to support both students, their learning, their development, as well as bettering the quality of life in Harrisonburg. And whenever we improve the quality of life in Harrisonburg, that improves JMU, that makes us a better community to, to live in. So um, by offering housing, by offering connections, that allows um, those refugee families to uh, thrive. And that's our hope overall. Okay. Um, so what kind of work is being done by the volunteers? Because I understand you have some students that 
volunteer for right, you guys. So. Right. So volunteers are at the student level, at the faculty level, and it's everything from being interns who will help refugees find their way around the community and get the support and services they need to faculty, integrating it into their classes. And so we had students last year make a video for refugee families when they move into permanent housing to learn how to use uh, Western style housing like kitchens and other um, appliances and devices, for instance. Well, thank you so much for being here, Definitely. Steve. Definitely. Enjoyed it. Um, back to you, Madison and Olivia. A right-wing speaker came to campus, and JMU students on both sides of the debate flexed their First Amendment muscles. We'll show you why Liz Wheeler caused such an uproar. And a little later, we'll speak with Adanya Moyer, the only person of color on JMU's lacrosse team. Hear her thoughts on the struggles and her love of playing a sport where 99% of D1 athletes are white. Welcome back to Changemakers, a news magazine dedicated to Gen Z issues. Before the break, we took a deep dive on how this generation looks at gun control issues. Right now, we're going to take a look at both sides of the debate over LGBTQ plus rights. Marsha P. Johnson was 24 years old when she threw the first brick during the 1969 police raid on the Stonewall Inn in New York City. The protests following the raid kickstarted the LGBTQ rights movement nationally. Johnson, a black trans sex worker, would go on to help found the street transvestite action revolutionaries, an organization fighting for gay rights. Since the 60s, the gay rights movement has gone national in scope. Protesters have marched on Washington, D.C. multiple times. In the 80s, the rights movement focused on how the Reagan administration was dealing with the AIDS pandemic. At the time, AIDS was devastating the LGBTQ community. Many of the rights gained have been during Gen Z's lifetime. The landmark Supreme Court case, Lawrence v. Texas, in 2003, repealed so-called sodomy laws, and the court decision in Obergefell v. Hodges in 2015 paved the way for gay marriage. According to a Gallup poll, around 20% of Gen Z identifies as LGBTQ. That's up nearly 10% from the millennial generation, and nearly 17% more than baby boomers. For Gen Z, the fight for LGBTQ rights, especially trans rights, is incredibly important. The fight continues this year. 49 state legislators have introduced more than 500 bills that trans right activists would consider anti-trans. Next up, these student activists are fighting to spread the word on issues members of the LGBT community face in our current climate. LGBTQ members strive for change through education and advocacy in their community through the classroom. Um, initially, I'd focus on the Soji topic, so we did the stuff about identities, um, including specific ones on transgender identities as well. I think it's really important to increase the understanding of it because, um, as I said earlier, I think a lot of people come from a place of ignorance and not necessarily that they don't want to accept, they just don't understand. While others choose to focus on spreading awareness through Greek life. It's a pretty new role, which um, was a little scary to take on. We have an entire resources document that we made of everything at JMU and um, outside of JMU that involved diversity, equity, and inclusion just for people to like go if they ever need anything. We started doing like these little graphics because there's so many diversity, equity, and inclusion events on campus every single week. Like there's, it's actually insane. Organizations like Friendly City Safe Space look to be just that, a safe space for the LGBTQ community here in Harrisonburg. Speaking of, it's very kind of similar to the Lavender Lounge and the fact that it offers resources and a place to connect and a safe place to be. It's nice to have that in the community so that even if you're not in college, you still have a place where you know you're going to be accepted, you know you're going to be safe, and that you can find community and friends through it as well. You know, it can be dangerous at times and like deeply, deeply mentally taxing um, to not have a space to return to that has resources and like-minded individuals who know your experiences personally again even if you have a, um, a super understanding and accepting circle um, safe spaces are super important because gender identity is an extremely personal understanding and so when you have when you know someone who identifies the way that you do that's a super strong connection that you're building even if it's not like I don't know, it doesn't even need to be a friendship necessarily, just like acknowledging someone else's existence in the same space as you makes you feel a lot less isolated, especially if you're going through like some serious stuff in regards to like the people around you. 
I'm Mackenzie Munn, reporting for Changemakers. It was two weeks ago when the Young Americans Foundation brought Liz Wheeler to speak on campus. The decision left many members on campus in outrage. Reporters Javen Riddles and Joshua Dixon took on the Liz Wheeler event while reporter Zia Fakiri was front at the protest. Here's a look at the event before, during, and after. Campus divide over what half considered free speech and the other half hate speech. To Liz Wheeler, I am a human being. I have a heartbeat and a mother who is terrified that I will not come home. Queer theorists don't care about these people. They don't care about the identity crisis that they've created. They've already used these young people and abused them and destroyed them, and that is so, so evil. After SGA approved and funded for the speaker months prior, the days leading up to the event saw great unrest within the student body with lots of backlash online. The far right-leaning Liz Wheeler speaks on one side of the campus with YAF, the organization that brought her here. And the truth of the matter is, if you want to look at it from a practical standpoint, nothing that queer theory is promising them is going to be true. They're not going to feel better emotionally, mentally, or physically if they transition, if they don this new identity. And the trans rights protesters trying to defend their views on the other side of campus. We in this community have built each other up and helped when we get torn down. We will not be torn down. We will not be told that we aren't good enough for basic human rights simply because of the color of our skin, our sexuality, or our gender. And we will never be silenced. We stick together and we conquer it all. Inside, while mostly filled with supporters, a couple reporters and students asked questions challenging the speaker's views. Plenty of people could make the same argument that you are doing the same thing that you're um, claiming the left is doing. Well, is it or is it not true that, that children's genitals are being mutilated in the name of the transgender ideology? Do you have proof of that? Yes, I do. Have you Googled I, it? Oh, I've Googled plenty, yes. Outside, the protesters marched from the central part of campus to outside the event's doors declaring the rights of the transgender community and displeasure for the speaker. Raise your hand if you're here to support your queer, trans, and other minority population siblings. While the viewpoints between the two groups remain polarized, the idea behind both events, bringing people together, were closer than most people think. I think it's so inspiring. I think it's so amazing to see so many people realize that they're not alone here and that they have so many people to back them too. Yeah, well, I'm here to inspire other conservatives on campus. We have a plethora of conservative clubs here, but not when they can actually bring speakers to campus. So that's what you have to us. That's what Young Americans for Freedom and the foundation does itself. It's actually bring conservative speakers here to make sure that people like me and like Gen Z are actually known and putting our voices out here on campus. It just showed me that there are people that need to be heard and sometimes they just need to be given that space. While the dust has settled, the issues that were talked about on both sides during the event remain prominent. I'm Javen Riddles, reporting for Changemakers. Former University of Kentucky swimmer Riley Gaines was another activist that recently visited JMU's campus. Sharing her experience in the 2022 NCAA Championships, where she competed against trans student athlete Leah Thomas. Since the championship, Gaines has become a prominent voice for protecting women's sports. Because up until this point, I mean, I knew the unfair competition was wrong. I knew the locker room aspect was wrong. But when this official reduced everything that I, not just myself, all of us, when he reduced everything that we had worked our entire lives for down to a photo op to validate the feelings of a male, that's when I knew it was time for someone to stand up because up until this point, I was waiting for a coach or some other swimmer or a parent or someone within the NCAA or someone with political power, someone who is supposed to be protecting us to protect us, to stand up for us and, and say that this was wrong. I know we're adults, but it felt like there was someone else who should have been in place to stand up before it took me to stand up. Um, but it finally hit me. You know, if we as female athletes weren't willing to stick up for ourselves, how could we expect someone else to stick up for us? Up next, we take a look at the history of the hashtag MeToo movement and how some students are standing up for survivors of sexual assault on JMU's campus, as well as what it's like to be a woman in sports. And after that, the existential crisis Gen Z faces in the battle against climate change. Thanks for staying with us on Changemakers, the news magazine focusing specifically on Gen Z. 
The fight for women's rights, from fighting back against sexual harassment to breaking down color barriers and employment barriers is a major piece of Gen Z activism. The phrase Me Too originated on MySpace in 2006 by activist Tarana Burke, a sexual assault survivor. In 2017, the hashtag became nationally known as a result of dozens of women coming out against Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. Many others would come forward against other major figures in Hollywood as a result of the hashtag Me Too movement. The movement would eventually spread to college campuses as many survivors would come forward and share their stories of assault. Nationally, one in four women will experience some form of sexual violence during their time at college. As survivors, empowered by the hashtag MeToo movement came forward, colleges and universities such as Rutgers, Michigan State, Ohio State, and many others underwent major changes to help survivors. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and this year students are banding together to fight against sexual violence on college campuses. Members of JMU's SASV speak on why events like these are important for the campus. We're good, go! We're putting down flags that represent the undergraduate population that has been affected by sexual violence or will eventually be affected by sexual violence in their life. We actually have 7,303 flags, um, so that represents over a third of the student population, undergraduate student population. Just like kind of puts into perspective how often this is happening and how many people this is happening to. I know the statistic right now is one in four women and one in 16 men, so I think that just puts into perspective like you know people that have been affected by this. And the more we can have an open dialogue about it, um, the more change that can be done. It's so like important to have these community the events dollars. to really bring okay. everybody together because it shows that it's not just survivors fighting for survivors, but they have so many people around them that are supporting them. Um, I think it's just really great to bring awareness to the issue because it is so pervasive. You see the sea of blue and it really makes you think about how many people around you are actually affected by sexual violence. When looking at the history of women in sports media, it is impossible to ignore two important trailblazers in the field, Melissa Ledke and Mary Garber. Ledke was an MLB reporter covering the 1977 World Series between the New York Yankees and the Los Angeles Dodgers when the league commissioner barred Ledke from entering the Yankees locker room. She sued and won a landmark case that allowed women reporters into locker rooms. Garber was the only female sports writer in the ACC for nearly 30 years, from 1946 to 1976. She was also the first woman inducted into the U.S. Basketball Writers Association Hall of Fame in 2002. Garber was actively reporting on sports for nearly 60 years, and there are many other trailblazing women in sports media in Generation Z continuing to break through barriers in the sports industry. Changemakers anchor Olivia Roth spoke with former JMU alumna Bridget Condon, who is making waves as a woman in sports media. NFL Network anchor Bridget Condon is one of the changemakers in the sports industry. The former Madison reporter graduated from JMU in 2015 and after working in local sports for nearly six years, found her way as an anchor and reporter for the league. I realize sports can be such a big part of people's lives and it can bring all different people from various backgrounds together. I found sports journalism. Condon talks about how she fights against the norms in a male-dominated industry. I think as a woman, you always get held to a higher standard, which, you know, you can look at as a negative or a positive. For me, I take it, you know, with a grain of salt, knowing I'm going to prepare harder. Condon is one of 15 female reporters for the NFL Network and a part of the nation's 15% of female sports reporters in the country, according to a 2022 study. Yet despite having one of the most prominent voices in football, Condon said she has faced her own difficulties throughout her career, both in local sports and at the network. I think if I make a mistake, um, it is such a bigger deal than if a male colleague makes a mistake, which can be frustrating. But again, like I've been saying, it just makes me work harder and know that it, I'm going to have to do a little bit more to prove to people that I do belong here. Many high school and college female sports journalists have used social media platforms like TikTok to show their resilience and desire to make a mark on the sports industry. With voices like Beth Mowens, Pam Oliver, and Condon, the former Duke says she hopes there will be a day where men and women share the screen equally in the wide world of sports. I hope that the more, the longer women are around, people don't just look at females in these roles as the token female journalist, right? Because I think a lot of people look at, you know, if you look at some of the sets that are, whether it's NBA, NFL, whatever, 
a lot of times it's four men up there and then you might have your one token female journalist off to the side or being the sideline reporter and i think once there can be four women sitting up there three women two women an equal amount of men and women is what i want to see african americans make up less than four percent of all ncaa lacrosse players making jane muse adonia moyer one of the few becoming a division one athlete is hard enough but doing it as a person of color in predominantly white sport and at a predominantly white school is even harder. Our reporter Joshua Dixon tells her story and how she was able to overcome so much adversity. Being at a PWI playing a predominantly white sport, it does feel a little odd sometimes because you're like, oh, I feel like, like the black sheep, one that stands out the most. And like growing up with it, it was kind of weird because, you know, when you grow up, and aspire to be something you want to see people like you before doing it to like have rep representation. I could tell for other people seeing me in the sport, it was kind of throwing them off as well. Roadblocks I faced were racism. At a young age, I was a part of a PG Pride rec organization. Like games and stuff, we'd be called slurs and just looked at wrong. But being on the team that I was, with the diverse community, it made me feel better about continuing the sport. It's like a mental battle at that point. You have to kind of keep yourself going. My parents have to keep me encouraged. I remember someone was like, oh, I'm surprised like that you're playing so well. Oh my God, your parents are such good people. Like, <laughs> like why wouldn't they be? It was good to face that adversity because it makes, it makes me who I am today. Uh, when I heard about that, it wasn't a complete shock because I was like, of course, like, Howard would be called this or Delaware State. Oh, of course, they thought the bus with all black players on it had drugs. Like, well, that's because I see it more often than everyone else, but it was just sad, I guess, to see it still happening. I started the Black History like activity and conversation because of what happened to Howard and Delaware State. I like reiterated the issue that both teams faced, why it's important, had them do research as to what like black people go through on a daily basis. And then we did an activity where they picked someone in black history, present, past, that made an impact on our society today. That's the, that's the amazing part, having the team that's open, welcoming, like wanting to hear what I have to say, because it would be so hard and I'd be so closed off from the team if they didn't allow me that opportunity. Keep yourself motivated with the love and support that you have around you because it will be hard, but you have support backing you up and like, just keep going. And if you're facing adversity or people telling you you can't, you just stepping on the field every day is showing that you can, so. As we come toward the end of our show, let's now look at how Gen Z is working hard towards a cleaner earth and how the environmental movement has evolved under Gen Z. We will also look at how some people are attempting to do what they can at their own home, from sustainable agriculture to creative uses of mushrooms. Welcome back to Changemakers. Climate change is an issue Gen Zers have grown up with. Since the time we were born, high profile people from Al Gore to Greta Thunberg have talked about an impending climate crisis. Climate change is an issue Gen Zers are begging world governments to combat. And it makes sense. Millennials and Gen Z will be here when the effects of climate change can't be reversed. The history of climate change activism is littered with the older generation simply passing off problems to the younger. Gen Z is looking to change that dynamic. The Environmental Protection Agency was formed in 1970 under the Nixon administration. The formation of the EPA and major revisions of the Clean Air Act pushed climate change to the forefront. Since the 70s, awareness of human effects on our environment have only grown. The first major climate protest was in 1970, dubbed Earth Day. We now celebrate Earth Day each year on the day that the protest happened, April 22, 1970. 
20 million people participated across the U.S., with more than 100,000 people gathering in New York City for the Ecological Carnival. That event stretched nearly three miles through the center of Manhattan. Gen Zers and Millennials are continuing this tradition, with 70% of Gen Zers and Millennials saying that climate change should be a top priority. Not only that, but today's leaders in climate change are the youngest ever. Major figures like Greta Thunberg are fighting for crucial changes to how we treat our planet. We are now joined by senior reporter Cullen Monroe, who is live from JMU's Quad, to look for students to talk about climate change. How are you, Cullen, and what's going on? I'm doing great, Madison. Thank you. Today, I'm joined by Joe Molesky. He's a, he is a freshman biology major, and we're going to talk about climate change. Now, Joe, why is climate change an important issue to you? Uh, it's very important to me because it just impacts my day-to-day -day life and could impact my future. And what aspects to you are most important about climate change? Uh, the most important aspect is the carbon emissions that are created by cars and production. Mm -hmm. And let's say that we don't make the necessary changes that we need to make to climate change. How is that going to affect your life in the future? Uh, it might not necessarily affect my future, but my uh, generations in the, in the future, they'll be affected by um, it becoming warmer and colder at certain points. All right. Well, you heard it yourselves, folks. Thank you. And back to Madison and Olivia. Next up, mushrooms aren't just a staple in your diet anymore. They could soon become a staple of your home, too. Since she was a kid, Kaylin Berg has always had an issue with the insulation in her house. If it's in her own house, she says, why can't she touch it? Now, a senior ISAT major working on her capstone, she's found a way to replace fiberglass insulation with mushroom-based insulation, a material she claims is sturdier than fiberglass and environmentally friendly. You could make all sorts of stuff with mushrooms. They're making clothes out of it, things that can help with filtering water, cleaning up oil spills, air quality, soil quality, composting. Uh, it's just really interesting stuff. It's definitely more structurally sound than typical fiberglass and it also has a pretty solid ability to keep heat through evenly. They have a lot of different solutions to our mankind problem that we have going on right now. I mean we're just like destroying and they're fixing so we need to just kind of watch what they're doing and maybe mimic it a little bit. Kaylin said you can also grow the insulation from your garage. It would only take about $20 to grow the insulation for your entire house. It's easy to think the greenhouse effect as black smoke billowing out of stacks, but as change makers Colin Monroe shows us, one of the biggest producers of greenhouse gases is the food you put in your mouth every day. Since 2021, Tom Benevento has been climate farming, a practice that he believes can be used around the globe, all without the use of machines that he thinks just get in the way. Food is a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions. And if we could transform the way we grow our food, we can dramatically reduce emissions and not only do that, but draw down carbon and make it a net negative sink and actually be one of the most powerful solutions for climate change. Benevento's solution to climate change is not just a change of profession, but one of spirit as well. His life goal is to get humanity on board with his project. We have the chance to choose a future that's really beautiful, sustainable and resilient and includes everybody. And we also have the chance to not do that and just keep going with business as usual, which is a pathway of destruction. With climate change threatening a 15 to 50 percent decline in wheat, maize, and rice yields globally by 2050, the Jubilee Climate Farm focuses on practices that can be used whether the environment is arid, tropical, or somewhere in between. One worker on the farm is planning to take what he learns at the farm back to his home country of Kenya. He says the Kenyan farmers are eager to learn how to cope with the changing climate. They're not getting the yield that they used to get. So uh, these kind of systems are really helping smallholder farmers that are starting to change how they were, they're used to mono, mono cropping, now to more diverse systems that yes. help the cl climate and help us, them to uh, increase their yields. The staff at Jubilee hope their sustainable farming practices will catch on. They're creating networks through nonprofits around the world to do so. Es un proyecto nuevo. It's a new project, but I feel that there is hope that someday we can change the people close to here and change their mentality, because it is beneficial for everyone to change. Maybe they will help, because the earth is being hurt a lot with chemicals and many lands are being mistreated. Reporting for Changemakers, I'm Cullen Monroe. Styrofoam. It's used in hospitals, for packages, and takeout, 
but this capstone in ISAT is focusing on a different way to use this non-recyclable material. Um, this is uh, an insulated concrete form, or known as ICF, uh, and you can build houses out of these. You stack them, pour it full of concrete, um, but the problem with these is that they use virgin styrofoam, and we're trying to use styrofoam waste. Uh, and as you can see, we have quite a lot of styrofoam waste, and this was really without even trying. Uh, nobody is recycling it, and landfills don't want it either, because landfills get paid by the ton. This doesn't weigh anything, but it takes up a lot of space. It's like this. So it's, it's almost like a beanbag chair, um, styrofoam. We're down to the individual pellets uh, instead of you know, big chunks. I used 70 of those as the foundation for my garage for uh, when I built a house. And that was a little scary because they'd never been tested before. I figured it out, it worked great, and uh, my garage is now sitting on it. So being in this project kind of made me realize like, oh, like, you can do these little, little tiny things and all of a sudden it's like way better for the environment. Why don't more people do that? I think the hardest part kind of determining right consistency between like should be of the blocks. Tested different uh, mix ratios. You know, we wanted it to be as light as possible, but not sacrifice strength. Sometimes, you know, we'd put more cement and then the, the block is like too hard. It's too cementy, not enough styrofoam. We also tried to minimize the amount of Portland cement we used because that has uh, a large environmental footprint. Or vice versa, it's too much styrofoam, not enough cement. So we were just working around the edges of all these things, also trying to improve the production process. Kind of just experimenting and finding that like perfect recipe. Tinkered with a couple different types of molds. It made me want to help others feel as ex excited and as passionate about the topic of like sustainability as me. Uh, whether you're in a flood zone or a fire zone or a termite zone or something where stick frame houses uh, suffer, this is the right, uh, this is a better material there. So if somebody else takes this and runs with it um, and ultimately results in less styrofoam ending up in the landfill, uh, I call that a win. As dirty as I got coming in here, it was, it was also fulfilling to you know, end the day saying like, all right, we made another block. Thank you for joining us on Changemakers. We hope the show has informed you and maybe even taught you a few things you didn't know. I'm Olivia Roth. And I'm Madison Heritzik. Changemakers took a village to create and we'll leave you tonight with a look at the people behind the scenes who helped bring these stories to life.